Welcome to Module 5, Kidney Replacement Therapy, Transplantation. This module is designed to help all healthcare professionals who give care to patients with chronic kidney disease and require kidney replacement therapy in the form of transplantation. We will describe this therapy from the donor and recipient perspectives and for both the newly transplanted and long-term patients. The module will also discuss adjuvant therapies, such as medication to manage the health of the transplanted kidney and common complications that may arise. We realize that we share the care for many of these patients with you. We hope that the information in this module will help you care for them and help you communicate with us. A glossary of terms, references, and links to resources can be found in the PDF handout for this course. This set of modules, Chronic Kidney Disease, What Every Nurse Caring for the Patient with CKD Should Know, is dedicated to the memory of Sally Burroughs Hudson, a past president of ANNA and a fierce proponent of continuing education for all nurses. This is the fifth module in the CKD What Every Nurse Should Know series, created by the American Nephrology Nurses Association, ANNA, and should be viewed in conjunction with module one. The nephrology nurses who have created these modules have done so believing that your understanding of our shared patients and their therapies will enhance our shared care of them and communication between us. As you go through this module, you will learn that though transplantation offers our patients with kidney failure the best kidney replacement therapy outcomes, it is not a cure for CKD, and both the procedure and long-term treatment regimen are complex. And for each patient recipient, there is a donor patient, either living or deceased, whose care, if somewhat short-term, is also complex. The transplant recipient is also at risk for every other disease and injury known to healthcare workers, and so many non-nephrology nurses will be participating in their care over time. The following objectives will be our guide in this module of kidney transplantation. You will be able to explain why kidney transplantation has the best patient outcomes for the suitable patient with kidney failure. List the different types of kidney donors. Discuss the kidney transplant evaluation process. Briefly describe the surgical and postoperative procedure for both the living donor and recipient and outline the long term treatment of the recipient. So let's get started with a brief history of kidney transplantation. The first successful kidney transplant was performed in 1954 at the Brigham Hospital in Boston. The donor and recipient were identical twins, one of whom had severe kidney disease. The transplant was successful because they were identical twins sharing the same tissue type thus the potential for organ rejection was significantly reduced. Prior attempts at kidney transplantation had not been successful due to organ rejection. At that point, there was little knowledge and understanding about the significance of tissue typing and matching in order to avoid the immune system response to a foreign body, the transplanted kidney. Surgeon Peter Medawa and his colleagues conducted research using chickens to elicit the effects of the body's immune response and the physiology of transplanted tissue rejection. Their research led to the understanding of the human immune response and tissue rejection, and they received the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1960 for their work. Today, the biological relationship of donor and recipient is not nearly as important due to the creation of powerful immunosuppressant medications, which are usually able to prevent rejection. 
These medications have thus enabled the successful long-term transplantation of hundreds of thousands of patients with kidney failure. And most recently, an executive order in 2019 to reform performance of organ procurement foundations went into effect late in 2020. It has the goal of increasing organ donation and kidney transplantation and the quality and quantity of life that it brings to our kidney failure patients. To illustrate our history and where we are today, we have data. The United States Renal Data System, the USRDS, is an amazing and reliable source of data about the demographics and care of our CKD patients, including those with kidney failure who are receiving kidney replacement therapy. As you can see in this graph, the prevalence of kidney failure is on the rise. And notice that while the majority of kidney failure patients were on dialysis at the end of 2018, almost one third of the total prevalent population was successfully transplanted, a testimony to the superiority of this therapy. But we need to do more. The total number of the prevalent population reflecting all the patients receiving kidney replacement therapy on the last day of 2018 was over 783,000. Of that number, there was 62% of patients undergoing in-center hemodialysis. But for the first time in US history, there were more than 10,000 patients performing home hemodialysis at year's end. The number of peritoneal dialysis patients increased to almost 59,000. Finally, the number of prevalent patients with a functioning transplant increased in to 230,000 in 2018. So gratifying to see as it is the only therapy that restores the benefits of normal kidney function. This becomes evident when review of the most recent comparative mortality data between dialysis and transplant shows an overall mortality rate that is more than three times higher for patients on dialysis compared with those that are successfully transplanted. Mortality rates after one year on dialysis are 20 to 25% and at five years, survival rate is around 35%. Whereas people that receive a kidney transplant have a mere 3% mortality rate after five years. So why are we not transplanting more patients? The answer is complex, but a simplified version of it is that there are just not enough kidney donors living or deceased to meet the demand. These recent data from the United Network for Organ Sharing, UNOS, show us that as of June 2020, there were over 100,000 people, adults and children, on the kidney transplant waiting list, waiting for a kidney from a deceased donor. Remember that number as we go to the next slide and see on the upper left, that only some 18,000 patients were fortunate enough to get a kidney in 2019. Less than one in five of those waiting. This is not a new problem. Between 2013 and 2019, there have been some 63,000 deceased donor kidney transplants and almost 42,000 living donor kidney transplants performed in the United States. That volume is growing every year. However, this tells us that donor numbers are not sufficient to meet the demand, which reinforces that the donor approach process, particularly with deceased donors, must be done in a very sensitive fashion and of course, in accordance with the law. We know that all of us and our loved ones are potential donors, living or deceased. Still, Many healthcare workers, along with the general public, are not aware of the huge disparity between the number of kidneys donated and the number needed. 
the recent executive order and 2020 CMS ruling to upgrade the performance of organ procurement organizations is a very positive step, not only with the logistics of organ donation, but also to educate the public about this dire shortage. Part of that education is dispelling some myths that have accumulated over time. For example, one myth is that when organs are removed, the donor's body is mutilated, making an open casket viewing impossible. The truth is that organ recovery is performed as an actual surgical procedure, the body's integrity is preserved, and an open casket viewing is possible. Another myth is that the elderly cannot donate their organs. In fact, organ donation can be done at any age. The donor's medical condition will be assessed at time of death to determine suitability for organ donation. Another very sad myth is that if you are an organ donor, medical efforts will not be made to save your life. This is not so. All efforts are made to save a potential donor's life. One has to volunteer to be an organ donor by making it clear on their driver's license, state donor registry, and or telling their loved ones of their wishes to be an organ donor. Finally, there is a myth that the rich and famous are considered priority recipients for organ donation. In truth, a recipient's opportunity for an organ is based on their blood type, waiting time on the transplant list, overall medical condition, and other factors. As we have shown, there are over 100,000 kidney failure patients hoping for a transplant because kidney transplant has outcomes far superior to dialysis, which result in increased patient life expectancy. These superior outcomes are because the transplanted kidney functions as a normal kidney. So there is usually no need for dialysis once the kidney is fully functional and the patient regains all the other benefits of kidney function, which dialysis cannot replace. Newly transplanted recipients often tell us that they had forgotten what it was like to feel good. Some expand on this saying that they feel less physically drained with a kidney transplant than they did while on dialysis and that they have more energy. Many mention that they love being able to eat a regular diet with regards to kidney function. However, a healthy diet is emphasized, especially where comorbidities exist, such as diabetes and hypertension. This return of health helps kidney transplant recipients resume normal life stage appropriate activities, such as traveling, working, or having children. Additionally, physical deterioration due to the complications of CKD, such as bone disease, is halted and sometimes even reversed to a degree. Kidney transplantation is a complex process. And that complexity is increased because a successful transplant involves not just one patient, but two, the donor and the recipient. It takes an interdisciplinary team of experts working with both patients to make the transplant happen. And the process begins with intensive evaluation. This slide depicts broad categories of patient dimensions that must be evaluated for both living donors and recipients prior to the transplantation. The order is not indicative of priority or timeline, but all dimensions must be considered in order to assemble an a holistic assessment. Patients' cultural and religious beliefs can determine how they view illness and wellness. It is important to ascertain any cultural beliefs that might have a negative impact on the transplant process. Because of the complexity of transplantation, both in the short and long term, patient's health literacy and understanding of patient education must be considered because comprehension of the process and follow-up is vital. Though all members of the IDT contribute, Patient education is often done by the nurse. Throughout the process, 
It is the nurse who will teach patients and families about all aspects of the workup, procedures, post-op recovery, and long-term expectations. Social support adds an important dimension to the success of the transplant. A social worker assesses the overall living and social support situation of both living donors and recipients to ensure that measures are in place for adequate post-operative support from caregivers once the patients are discharged from the hospital. The social worker's assessment can also reveal concerns that need to be addressed by other members of the transplant team. For example, the psychiatrist or psychologist. Financial issues can be a significant cause for anxiety. The financial coordinator on the IDT assesses the type of financial coverage the patient has as it relates to the entire transplant process, including long-term post-operative care and management. Typically, the donor's costs are covered by the recipient's health care coverage. Recipients who have current or past health, mental health concerns are assessed by a transplant psychiatrist or psychologist, either for resolution of the issue or treatment management. Some issues that warrant psychiatric assessment include alcoholism, drug abuse, bipolar disorder, and depression. Kidney donors are assessed to elicit any untoward emotions about being a donor, such as guilt, coercion, or resentment. We'll discuss this more in the following slides. The transplant dietitian performs a nutritional assessment to determine the current nutritional status of the recipient. The patient's body mass index, current comorbidities that require dietary modifications, and overall, how the patient is managing their nutritional needs are addressed. Recommendations are made as needed. Transplant clinical pharmacists are also a vital part of the IDT. They have expertise in patient education, detection of major drug adverse events and interactions, and improvement of adherence. Pharmacists play a vital role in patient monitoring to determine whether or not a specific event was caused by a specific medication. In regards to medical suitability, the nephrologist assesses the patient's medical and surgical history, as well as making recommendations for further medical consultations and tests as needed. Rounding out the evaluation is the surgeon who is performing the donor or recipient procedure. The surgeon assesses the patient's anatomy, physiology, and surgical risk. The surgeon also makes recommendations for further medical consultations and tests as needed. As we have already seen, donors are the rate limiting factor in this life enhancing and preserving therapy. There are five categories of kidney donors. The largest category as seen in the UNOS data slide, slide is that of the deceased donor. A deceased donor is someone who has died as a result of brain or cardiac death and who has generously directed that their organs, if suitable, be donated for transplantation or who has a family member that agrees to donate the patient's organs at the time of death. The patients on the waiting list are the beneficiaries of this gift. Directed donation is a small subset of this category. Directed donation occurs when organs from a deceased donor go to a pre-selected recipient. In other words, the deceased donor before death, specifically selects the person to whom he or she wants to give a kidney to upon death. The remaining categories are all living donors. The most common type of living donation is living related. This is the donation of an organ from one blood relative to another, such as from one sibling to another or from a parent to a child. 
Living biologically unrelated donation is the donation of an organ from one person to another when the people are not related by blood. Common examples include donations between spouses or best friends. Non-directed kidney donation involves a living donor who wishes to donate one of their kidneys anonymously. This situation is also referred to as altruistic donation. Living donation is typically the best hope of success for the recipient and is the fastest means to a kidney transplant. Another subset of deceased donors are public health service increased risk donors. Due to organ shortages, kidneys from increased risk donors are now considered for some patients. The phrase increased risk refers to the donor characteristics that could place the potential recipient at increased risk of disease transmission. A potential organ donor may be labeled as increased risk for a variety of different exposures. And these exposures carry different risks of transmitting recent infection with HIV, hepatitis B, or hepatitis C. Nucleic acid testing is a highly sensitive method of testing now available for HIV, HCV, and other infectious diseases. This type of testing gives transplant centers further reassurance and decreases the chances drastically for transplant transmitted infections. Due to advances in the treatment of hepatitis C, many transplant centers and patients on the waiting list purposely accept a kidney from a donor with known hepatitis C. This may shorten the wait time for patients on the waiting list and requires informed consent from the patient. The patient may already be hepatitis C positive themselves or not. Either way, after receiving a kidney from a hepatitis C positive donor, lab work is done frequently to monitor for the infection. If the patient does develop hepatitis C, treatment is initiated. Direct acting antivirals are now considered the best type of treatment for hepatitis C and can eliminate the virus from your body. Living kidney donors are the best kidney source for a patient. They are available more quickly, that is no waiting list, and they work better and longer. A living donor must complete a very thorough medical and psychosocial evaluation to be a donor. This means that only the healthiest people are allowed to donate. Living donation is 100% voluntary and the donor usually is a relative or someone who has close relationship with the patient. However, that is not required. Some people do, do volunteer to donate altruistically. If a person wishes to donate and they are not compatible with their intended recipient, there are options to either desensitize the recipient by removing antibodies from their blood or consider a kidney paired exchange. Unfortunately, not all potential living donors are blood type matches to their intended recipients. However, there are innovations to deal with this issue. One method is to treat the recipient with plasmapheresis, a procedure that removes the recipient's antibodies. Plasmapheresis is performed before and after the kidney transplant to prevent rejection. Another ingenious social solution being utilized is called paired exchange or swap. This occurs when two inversely mismatched donor recipient pairs swap with one another, such that the donor of pair one donates to the recipient of pair two and the donor of pair two donates to the recipient of pair one. 
This diagram illustrates what happens in a paired exchange. Mary and Lucy, the donor recipient pair on top of the slide, have incompatible blood types. Mary is a willing donor with blood type A. And Lucy, her friend and hopeful recipient, is blood type B. The donor recipient pair on the bottom of the slide is comp comprised of sisters Kari and Josie. Josie, who needs a transplant, has blood type A. Kara is a potential donor with blood type B. And since Mary and Josie both have blood type A and Lucy and Kara both have blood type B, Mary can donate to Josie while Kara simultaneously donates to Lucy. You may have seen in the media where there have been multiple simultaneous swaps. This is an undertaking of huge complexity, requiring exquisite coordinate, coordination to assure the best outcomes for all involved. Specific to the living donor, there are many considerations to be evaluated. Tissue compatibility is not the only factor that must be assessed in the evaluation of an appropriate donor. In the philosophy of do no harm, it is the responsibility of the IDT to ensure that the living donor's health will not be compromised by the donation. This requires an extensive evaluation. UNOS guidelines require transplant centers to provide all living donors with an independent living donor advocate to guide the potential donor through the evaluation process and provide non-biased counsel as needed. This ILDA cannot be involved in any way with the kidneys recipient's care or evaluation. The evaluation process begins with comprehensive information on the donation process, including assurance that the transplant procedure is elective and that there are alternative treatment options for the recipient. There is also an in-depth explanation of the medical and psychological risks of the donation process, including the testing, surgery, and long-term implications of living with one kidney, as well as potential benefits, such as a strengthened bond between donor and recipient. The, the psychosocial assessment, which may involve a social worker, psychiatric nurse, psychologist and or psychiatrist explores the donor recipient relationship and assesses willingness to donate, family dynamics and any history of depression or psychological disorders. Overall, the concern should be the effect of stress on the donor's health and well-being with a risk benefit assessment. Any negatives discovered in the evaluation may contraindicate donation. Next, let's examine the evaluation of potential recipients. While transplant is the kidney replacement therapy with the best long-term outcomes, not all CKD patients are candidates for this therapy. However, every Medicare kidney failure patient must be evaluated for suitability to be transplanted on an individual basis. Broad groups of patients are no longer automatically excluded. For more information on those groups, see module three in this series or ANNA's core curriculum. Early referral for transplant evaluation that is, referral prior to the initiation of dialysis, is encouraged. Preemptive transplant has many physical benefits for the patient, including bypassing the iatrogenic effects of dialysis and achieving better post-transplant graft and patient survival. Early referral also means that in the United States, patients may begin to accrue points on the deceased donor transplant waiting list, beginning when their GFR is estimated to be 20 or less. Part of the reason that such a small percentage of transplants are preemptive is that the evaluation is extensive and can take many months. 
uremia may force the start of dialysis before the evaluation is complete. The complexity of the pre-transplant evaluation is necessary to determine the patient's suitability for transplant by identifying and where possible correcting medical and psychosocial factors that might negatively affect the successful outcome of the transplant, both in the short and long term. The recipient transplant evaluation is conducted by the interdisciplinary transplant team, which includes a transplant coordinator, usually a nurse, surgeon, nephrologist, social worker, financial coordinator, and dietitian. The evaluation includes not only the medical, psychosocial, and financial evaluation, but also considers the patient's ability for self-management. During the evaluation, patients are also educated on potential outcomes, including complications and realistic expectations, reiterating that transplant is one of the options for treating kidney failure, but it is not a cure. Because every living donation kidney transplant involves two living patients, scheduling and timing of the surgeries can be complex. Once the donor and recipient evaluations are complete, the surgeries are scheduled. The day of the procedure, the donor is taken to the operating room first, where he or she receives anesthesia and is positioned laterally for the removal of the kidney. As illustrated, the majority of donor nephrectomies are done laparoscopically with the donor in this jackknifed position. The donor will convert to open, the procedure will convert to open surgery in the rare case of an intraoperative emergency, such as bleeding. With timed communication between the donor and recipient surgical teams, the recipient is brought to another operating room where he or she receives anesthesia and the procedure commences with making a three to five inch groin pocket into which the donor kidney will be placed. The native kidneys of the recipient are usually not removed. Paying close attention to strict sterile technique, the donor kidney is brought to the recipient room and placed inside the recipient. The blood vessels of the transplanted kidney are sewn to those of the recipient and the ureter is attached to the bladder. Soon after the anastomosis of the blood vessels and ureter, the kidney will produce urine. Each procedure can last anywhere from three to five hours with the donor procedure finishing first. The living donor usually stays in the hospital for two days. Unlike the surgical procedure for removing the kidney from a living donor, the procedure for a deceased donor is more complex. The deceased organ donation process begins when, while alive, the donor makes clear on their driver's license, state donor registry, and or to their loved ones that they wish to be an organ donor at their time of death. In the case that brain death is imminent or has occurred and has been confirmed by a neurosurgeon, the hospital will contact the organ procurement specialist in the area who will ascertain whether the deceased is a registered donor. If they are not, the legal next of kin for the deceased will be approached with regards to possible organ donation and consent. Along with the consent, information about the donor's health history and lifestyle will also be requested. During this time, organ perfusion is maintained through life support. A health examination of the deceased will also be conducted. If the deceased donor's health and lifestyle assessment is acceptable for donation, the organ procurement specialist will access the computerized organ matching system via UNOS's website, enter information about the donor organs, and run the match program to begin the search for the best potential recipients. 
That match run is based on waiting time on the organ transplant list, tissue and blood types, height, weight, and the acuity of the recipient. When donor and recipient matches have been confirmed, the organ procurement specialist dispatches various organ procurement teams to the donor's location to recover the organs and tissues. The deceased donor is taken to the operating room when the, where the organ procurement takes place. As with the living donor, strict attention is paid to sterile technique. Once removed, the organs and tissues are transported to the hospitals of the des designated recipients locally, regionally, and or nationally, and transplanted. From the time a kidney is removed from the donor to the time it is transplanted into the recipient, the kidney can be kept perfused by a machine or be placed on ice. A kidney can be transplanted as long as 36 to 48 hours after donor death. However, the goal is to transplant in under 24 hours to reduce cold ischemic time. The implant surgery on the recipient is the same, regardless of donor type. The recipient stays in the hospital for three to five days and his or her overall status is monitored with close attention paid to urine output and response to immunosuppressant medications. Kidney transplant patients tend to have post-operative pain for about one week. Feelings of tugging or stinging pain may remain around the incision for longer as adhesions form. Most patients do not require narcotics for pain after the first week or two. This of course assumes a normal post-op course without short-term complications. Complications that may occur soon after the transplant surgery include clots or kinking of the renal artery or vein or obstruction, stricture or leaking associated with the ureter. For more detailed information about these short-term anatomical complications, these can be found in the referenced ANNA core curriculum, chapter 21. Infection or bleeding may also occur as well as early rejection. Any sudden decrease in urine output, increase in abdominal pain or swelling, sudden changes in blood pressure, or fever should be reported immediately to the transplant team. The goal of immunosuppression is to modify the immune system sufficiently to prevent rejection, but not so much as to allow infection, malignancies, and other side effects. In spite of incredible advances, most immunosuppressants are not specific to the organ transplant rejection response. The net effect of most immunosuppressants is an overall suppression of the immune response, leading to an unfortunate increase in bacterial and viral infections, as well as certain types of cancers. Induction immunosuppression therapy is started in the perioperative period. Depending on the specific agent, it may be administered immediately prior to, during, and or after transplantation. Induction therapy is more potent than maintenance immunosuppression since the immune response is heightened in the early post-op period due to increased inflammation from surgery, ischemia reperfusion insult, and initial antigen exposure. The goal of induction immunosuppression is to significantly decrease the T cell response to the allograft. Dosing is tapered to achieve stable maintenance immunosuppression within the therapeutic targets determined by each center's protocol. Three of the more common agents used both for induction and rescue therapy are polyclonal and monoclonal antibody preparations, such as listed here. Acute rejection therapy, also known as rescue therapy, varies by center protocol. 
Agents used for rescue therapy in antibody-mediated acute rejection may include some of the previous induction drugs, as well as intravenous immune globulin, a protein that neutralizes circulating autoantibodies and alloantibodies and downregulates antibody production. IVIG may be used in conjunction with plasmapheresis to remove circulating antibodies and may also be used prior to transplantation in a highly sensitized recipient to reduce the panel of reactive antibodies and prevent a positive crossmatch. Another drug commonly used to reverse acute rejection is rituximab. It is a monoclonal antibody also used to, to treat post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder and many other autoimmune disorders. Rituximab has the advantage of a low incidence of infusion reactions and may be used in conjunction with plasmapheresis and IVIG administration. Routine early post-op management addresses all of the risks of any intra-abdominal surgery performed under general anesthesia. The maintenance of circulatory function is as usual, with added attention to assuring maintenance of function of any arteriovenous vascular access for hemodialysis, as well as heightened attention to the monitoring of leg pulses on the side of the transplanted kidney. Blood pressure needs to be monitored closely with a mean arterial pressure at about 80 millimeters of mercury necessary to assure perfusion of the transplanted kidney. Pulmonary toilets and early ambulation are essential to prevent both lung infection and deep vein thrombosis. Pain medication is administered as needed to promote activity and increase post-op comfort. Fluid and electrolyte balance take on a heightened drama for the patient and staff as function or lack thereof have multifactorial implications for physical and psychological patient care. Kidneys from a living donor usually function immediately upon transplantation rapidly restoring fluid and electrolyte balance and instilling a joyful euphoria for both the patient and family. The kidney of a deceased donor, however, may take hours to days to begin functioning, which is usually due to a reversible condition known as acute tubular nephropathy. This can be a cause of great anxiety to the patient, especially if dialysis treatments need to be resumed until kidney function is sufficient. In both cases, fluids and electrolytes are strictly monitored and managed accordingly. Prevention of infection cannot be overemphasized. As has been graphically demonstrated, Kidney transplant is by far the superior kidney replacement therapy in terms of both quantity and quality of life because of the return of normal kidney function. Still, a kidney transplant is not a cure because the transplanted kidney is foreign tissue and will require lifelong immunosuppression medication, which starts with high dosing. This puts an already at risk patient for infection at even higher risk. In caring for these patients, we walk a fine line between infection and rejection. Careful hand washing before and after patient contact is critical for all staff and visitors. Modified protective isolation is recommended for any recipient with leukopenia. For all patients, strict aseptic care of intravenous lines, any wounds, and the urinary catheter is mandatory. Pulmonary toilet has already been emphasized. Eating is rarely a problem for these newly transplanted patients. Indeed, they are frequently ravenous because of renewed appetite and the attraction of many foods that have been off limits with kidney failure. But it is important to remember that rapid wound healing requires adequate nutrition. 
Other prevention measures are to isolate infected patients, facilitate oral and skin hygiene, and administer prophylactic antiviral agents and antibiotics as prescribed. Continuous assessment of patients for signs and symptoms of infection is a given, as immunosuppression will be the leading therapy for this patient for the survival of the transplanted kidney. Remembering that the goal of this therapy is to maintain that balance between rejection and infection, induction therapy is tapered as quickly as possible to achieve stable maintenance immunosuppression within therapeutic targets as determined by each center's protocol. The most common long-term maintenance immunosuppressive regimen in the United States is mycophenolate mofetil in combination with tacrolimus. However, there are other maintenance medications, such as those listed here. The next few slides will detail these medications, their actions, and most common side effects. Mycophenolate mofetil and mycophenolate sodium are drugs that came into use in the mid-1990s and have replaced azathioprine as maintenance immunosuppression at many centers. These drugs selectively inhibit the proliferation of T and B lymphocytes and are mostly metabolized in the liver and eliminated via the kidney. They are commonly prescribed in combination with a calcineurin inhibitor, such as tacrolimus, cyclosporin, or sirolimus. Mycophenolates are administered orally every 12 hours and are administered at least two hours before or one hour after taking an antacid, such as magnesium oxide, calcium carbonate, or aluminum hydroxide. The dosing and tablet sizes for each are listed here. Like all immunosuppressants, these drugs have potential side effects. The patient's CBC is monitored closely for bone marrow suppression, and the skin is checked for potential squamous cell cancers. A consistently low white blood count may warrant a decrease in the mycophenolate dose. We watch for GI distress, as dehydration may result in stress on or possible injury to the transplanted kidney. Because it is mycophenolate mofetil, Cellcept, primarily that can cause diarrhea, the medication may be administered in doses of 250 milligrams four times per day. Decreasing the dose and increasing the frequency like this may help to alleviate diarrhea. Myfortic is a form of mycophenolate that is easier on the GI tract for many patients. The transplant team can suggest ways to alter the dose of mycophenolate to help if a patient has diarrhea. Last but not least, this class of drugs can put these patients at risk long-term for malignancies, so we monitor for those as well. The drug class of calcineurin inhibitors includes tacrolimus, which is the main immunosuppressant for many transplant patients. It is similar in action to cyclosporin, and a patient would take one or the other, but not both. Tacrolimus is used in combination with steroids or a mycophenolate, but it could be used alone in some patients. There is also an extended release tacrolimus. It is only taken once a day. Tacrolimus requires trough levels for appropriate dosing in these dosing options. Cyclosporin is rarely used now in the newly transplanted patient, but you may encounter some patients who were begun and have been maintained on this therapy. The most common side effects of tacrolimus are infection, as with all immunosuppressants, nephrotoxicity, hypertension, and headache and neurotoxicity that can lead to tremors or tingling sensation in the palms of the hands or soles of the feet. 
These tremors are common with tacrolimus and are dose related. Other signs of the neurotoxicity could be paresthesias, insomnia, tinnitus, increased light sensitivity, nightmares or sleep disturbances, and mood changes. Other potential side effects include diabetes, although not at the same rate as glucocorticos do, and over the long term of immunosuppression, malignancies. Velatocept is a selective co-stimulation blocker that has been developed to improve long-term outcomes in kidney transplant patients receiving re recipients by providing effective immunosuppression without the toxic effect of calcineurin inhibitors. It selectively inhibits T cell activation. Velatocept regimen is approved for use only in patients who are positive for the Epstein-Barr virus. Given the increased risk of post-transplantation lymphoproliferative disorder, predominantly involving the central nervous system in EBV seronegative patients. The most common side effects of Velatocept are listed here. Glucocorticoids, also called corticosteroids, add another protective dimension to the immunosuppression regimen with their anti-inflammatory effect. They are usually a first-line treatment for rescue from a mild to moderate acute rejection episode and are typically given over a three-day course. The determination of which medications and doses are required are based on the recipient's risk factors. All immunosuppressive medications should be given at the same time each day to obtain and maintain therapeutic blood levels. The most common glucocorticoid is prednisone, which is initially given through an IV for induction therapy and then orally once a day with tapering until the maintenance dose is achieved. Some transplant centers offered, offer steroid free or steroid avoidance therapy after the initial doses are given. Individuals suitable for steroid free or steroid avoidance are selected based on their medical status. The immunosuppressive regimen will vary from patient to patient. Prednisone may cause stomach upset. Acid blockers or proton pump inhibitors may be ordered to help prevent some of the GI complications that prednisone and several other immunosuppressive medications may cause. Nystatin swish and swallow is typically prescribed for about 30 days to prevent fungal infections. Early ambulation not only helps prevent DVT, but is important to minimize muscle weakness from steroids. Post-transplant diabetes mellitus, PTDM, may occur in association with prednisone use and patients should be carefully monitored for same. Prednisone has many potential side effects in addition to diabetes that can occur in varying degrees. These include the cushionoid appearance of chubby cheeks, increased appetite, sodium and or water retention, GI disturbances, peptic ulcers with bleeding, bruising easily, impaired wound healing, acne, diaphoresis, infections, especially opportunistic, and hyperlipidemia. Less common side effects that may occur include avascular joint necrosis, steroid induced diabetes, cataracts, growth retardation, anemia, thrombocytopenia, hypertension, emotional disturbances, and malignancies. Assessment and documentation of side effects over time helps with appropriate treatment. Dose tapering is frequently effective in ameliorating side effects. 
Of note is that though prednisone was always considered the primary culprit for weight gain in transplant recipients, many centers using steroid free or steroid avoidance protocols are finding recipients are still gaining weight. They are attributing this in part to improved appetite and less dietary restrictions. Weight gain is just one of the many possible side effects of steroids. Sirolimus is a newer immunosuppressant, which may be used in patients who do not tolerate, cyclos who do not tolerate cyclosporin or tacrolimus. Like those drugs, it inhibits T lymphocyte activation and proliferation and inhibits antibody production. Sirolimus may also be used in place of Imuram, MMF, or other inhibitors to prevent nephrotoxicity. Sirolimus is usually given orally once a day. Dosing options from 0.5 to 2 milligram tablets, which may be crushed but cannot be split or cut. Liquid doses must be mixed in orange juice or water. Doses are adjusted based on serum drug levels. One of the major side effects of sirolimus is hyperlipidemia. Medications may be prescribed for increased cholesterol and triglyceride levels. Wound healing may be impeded in patients taking sirolimus. Individuals who are predisposed to poor wound healing, such as diabetics, may not be candidates for this drug. In the early days of transplant, many patients did well for years, only to fall victim to immunosuppression-induced malignancy. Squamous cell skin cancer is the most common and eminently treatable, but much more serious cancers such as solid organ tumors or lymphomas frequently required cessation of immunosuppression in order to treat the malignancies. Imuran was one of the immunosuppressants with highest risk for malignancies, which is one of the reasons newer drugs such as tacrolimus have replaced it. Also, several malignancies are virally mediated, such as PTLD, which is due to the Epstein-Barr virus, and squamous skin cell cancer, which is due to the human papilloma virus. In summary, the body's immune system will always recognize the transplanted kidney as non-self and rejection of the organ will occur without adequate suppression of the immune system. This is why immunosuppressant medications are taken for the life of the transplanted kidney. It is essential for patients to take their immunosuppressants at the same time every day. And when medications are ordered twice daily, the dosages should be as close to 12 hours apart as possible. Some of the immunosuppressants, such as tacrolimus, cyclosporin, and sirolimus, require monitoring of blood levels. When a blood level is drawn, it is usually a trough level, which means that the patient does not take the medication prior to having blood drawn. The intention of the trough level is to check for the lowest blood level in a 12 hour period to determine whether this is in the therapeutic range. All immunosuppressants cause side effects. There is a constant balancing act between maintaining adequate immunosuppression and avoiding infections or other adverse effects of the medications. Monitoring and patient education, the nursing process, are key to effective management. As with any medication, it is important to monitor for any potential side effects on a regular basis and to notify the team when they are identified. Many side effects can be eliminated or significantly minimized by adjusting doses or changing to an alternative medication. All medications have potential risks. Diligent teaching, 
monitoring, and effective communication between the transplant team and recipient can have a significant impact in achieving a positive outcome and long-term success of the kidney transplant. The most common current immunosuppressants have been discussed. For details on lesser used medications such as Imuran and Cyclosporin, please see the resources section in the handout for this module. Next, let's talk about what else the patient might anticipate in life with a transplanted kidney. There are many benefits to transplantation, one of which is that we only see the complication-free long-term patient for occasional checkups, if at all. We are more likely to be caring for those patients experiencing complications. As such, the remainder of this module will focus on potential complications of the post-transplant patient. Using the nursing process to recognize potential complications and report nursing assessments early will ensure timely evaluation and intervention for the patient by the IDT. Remember that the patient continues to be at risk for complications of the primary disease such as diabetes and because they have just one functioning kidney, they have, by definition, chronic kidney disease. Remember, too, that prevention of rejection and infection is the focus of postoperative management of every kidney transplant patient, both in the short and long term. To assist you, an excellent resource for the nursing process can be found in the eighth edition of the Nephrology Nursing Scope and Standards of Practice. Nephrology nurses use the nursing process in providing care to the patient with kidney disease. The detailed standards of care in this process can be found in the 2017 edition of the Nephrology Nursing Scope and Standards. The evidence base for Nephrology Nursing's guidelines of practice and process of care can be found in the core curriculum for Nephrology Nursing, 7th edition 2020, and contemporary Nephrology Nursing, 3rd edition, as well as patient education that will enable the patient to partner with the IDT and successfully self-manage his or her care. As with any patient education, sensitivity to health literacy and individualization of the approach, considering the patient's family and family's cultural and health beliefs, preferences and wishes are necessary. Being forewarned is being forearmed for prevention when it comes to educating the patient about long-term complications. Chronic allograft nephropathy or chronic allograft failure, formerly known as chronic rejection, is the most common cause of kidney transplant failure after the first year following transplant. It is recognized by a slow variable rate of decreasing GFR and the presence of proteinuria and hypertension. Other causes of dis graft dysfunction need to be ruled out by biopsy. Risk factors for this complication are frequently non-preventable, such as delayed function, acute rejection episodes, or the nephrotoxicity of immunosuppression. But there are also preventable risk factors, such as poorly controlled diabetes and hypertension. The IDT may be able to delay progression of this chronic transplanted kidney failure by controlling blood pressure and blood glucose, treating hyperlipidemia, avoiding acute rejection, and prescribing angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers to decrease proteinuria. Immunosuppressive regimens may be altered for example, calcineurin inhibitor avoidance, and in some cases, plasmapheresis and immune globulin regimen may be used to prevent production of anti-donor antibodies. The risk of reoccurrence of the original disease in the transplanted kidney varies based on the cause, and prevention of recurrence must be addressed early. Certainly, this is of great concern as the majority of patients have diabetes. Pancreas transplants can offer prevention of this risk for some. 
For others, strict glucose control through medication, diet, and exercise can delay progression. Gastrointestinal complications are frequent and may present as ulcers, liver disease, cholecystitis, and pancreatitis. Ophthalmic conditions are frequently a result of glucocorticoids used for immunosuppression, and they come in the form of cataracts, glaucoma, and other visual disturbances. An annual dilated eye exam by an ophthalmologist is encouraged. Immunosuppression can also cause a number of metabolic complications. Hypertension, secondary hyperparathyroidism, cushionoid effects, and immunosuppression-induced diabetes mellitus are in this category. Diabetes occurs in a moderate fraction, approximately 20% of patients following kidney transplantation with these risk factors and comorbidities. Post-transplant care should include monitoring the patient for signs and symptoms, as well as monthly fasting plasma glucose checks if PTDM is suspected. If the FPG is greater than 100 but less than 125 with an associated A1C between 5.7 and 6.4, the patient is considered to have prediabetes. Monitoring of capillary stick glucose is advised if the patient's FPG remains elevated on two or three separate readings. If the FPG continues to be elevated, generally at or above 126, or the patient has an A1C greater than 6.5, the primary care provider or endocrinologist may consider oral agents or insulin therapy. Remember though that agents for treating diabetes must be modified according to kidney function as described in module three. Post-transplant chronic kidney disease is to be anticipated because a single kidney is transplanted and so almost all patients have at least stage two kidney disease. We use the same management guidelines for post-transplant chronic kidney disease patients as we do for same stage patients with CKD. Module two of this series details the care of the early CKD patient. As a general rule, we reduce immunosuppression whenever possible, especially nephrotoxic calcineurin inhibitors. We also monitor for other complications of CKD, such as osteoporosis. The risk of osteoporosis is quite high. Patients at risk should be screened with a bone density scan, a DEXA, at baseline, six months post-transplant, and at intervals indicated by risk factors. Treatment is use of calcium with vitamin D supplements in patients with normal calcium levels, and possibly bisphosphonates or calcitonin, depending on kidney function. Weight-bearing exercise is recommended for prevention and treatment of osteoporosis, and of course, any exercise is beneficial in the treatment and prevention of cardiovascular disease, which is another common complication in this patient population. The risk of cardiovascular disease in the post-transplant patient is multifactorial. It can be related to the transplant surgery itself as in the case of hypertension presenting as the cardinal symptom of transplant renal artery stenosis. If present, it usually occurs three months to two years after transplant, but it can occur later. TRAS presents as uncontrolled hypertension in spite of multiple medications, and diagnosis is through the identification of a new brewery over the allograft. As a result of decreased arterial inflow, kidney dysfunction may occur, particularly after the addition of ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Treatment includes antihypertensive therapy, surgical repair, or balloon angioplasty. In general, 
data show that hypertension contributes to cardiovascular disease in the general population. The transplant recipient has the general population risk plus the risk added by immunosuppressants such as the glucocorticosteroids, cyclosporin and tacrolimus, which all can increase blood pressure. Kidney dysfunction can increase blood pressure. Falling glomerular filtration rates and rising creatinine are signs of increasing dysfunction. The patient's adherence to the hypertensive medication regimen that must also be assessed, and we must pay attention to the patient's diet. Sodium intake is still important. Hypertension is to be expected and treated. Additionally, several studies have shown that kidney transplant recipients have a hypercoagulable risk. Some studies have linked coagulation abnormalities to cardiovascular disease in transplant recipients. Not surprisingly, many coagulation abnormalities have been linked to immunosuppressive agents. It is important for us to be alert to any hypercoagulable state that puts the patient at risk for clots or dysfunction. Relative to age and comorbidities, these patients are also at risk for heart failure, coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, and peripheral vascular disease. Complicating the risk of cardiovascular disease is the risk of hyperlipidemia, another side effect of immunosuppression. The goal of reducing lipids to target level is to prevent cardiovascular complications in patients with kidney disease. Cardiovascular complications such as heart attack and stroke are the greatest cause of graft loss in long-term kidney transplant recipients. Serolimus and prednisone often cause lipid disorders in transplant recipients. Lipid target goals for patients with kidney disease are listed here and statins are often prescribed to reach these goals. However, some statins have interactions with immunosuppressant medications, such as tacrolimus and serolimus, and can alter their therapeutic levels. With all statins, monitor liver function tests routinely. Azetamibi can also be used depending on kidney function. Cardiovascular disease may be part of the cause or result of kidney disease. Most premature deaths occurring in the late post-transplant period can be directly or indirectly attributed to events that lead to kidney failure and the consequences thereof. To understand how to prevent post-transplant CVD death and complications, we must identify the etiological risk factors. This is critical for three reasons. First, some factors can be modified with therapeutic lifestyle changes or medication, including a daily dose of 81 milligrams of aspirin. Second, it is important to identify risk factors that cannot be conservatively modified because risk factors help to identify high risk patients who can be targeted for screening and perhaps revascularization. Third, there is strong evidence that intervention improves survival. And who can do this assessment? Nurses. Nurses are frequently able to identify those risk factors that can be modified, and we nurses are in the best position to carry out both screening and interventions. Just as the nursing process evolves, we can continue to screen patients for new evidence of cardiovascular disease. Remember that the patient is the same person after the transplant procedure as he or she was before the transplant procedure. It is quite likely that the patient has the same problems he or she had before transplant, such as diabetes, hypertension, or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. 
To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, Aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, Aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, Aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, Aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD-related problems 
or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, 
aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems or hyperlipidemia, as well as any potential issues with medication adherence. To improve patient survival, aggressively treat these problems as well as any immunosuppressant CVD related problems.